This is Brand USA Talks Travel, elevating the conversation about international travel to the United States. Here's your host, Mark Lapidus. As a kid, did you have a big record collection or were you more of a radio listener? Great question. So through high school, probably more radio. College and on, record collection. We talking dozens, hundreds, thousands? Probably hundreds. <laughs> That's still a pretty big music fan, right? I started recollecting my vinyl collection now. I regret losing so many cool, cool recordings. I know the kids have reminded us, haven't they? They really have reminded us about how cool vinyl sounds. Oh, it's the most pure sound. They've never topped it. They've minimized it. They've digitized it. They have cheapened it, but they have never made it sound better. My guest today is Butch Spiridon. Since 1991, Butch has been the president and CEO of the Nashville Convention and Visitors Corporation, known to many of us as Visit Music City. Under Butch's leadership, Nashville has grown into a top global destination, generating over $7 billion in annual visitor spending. Butch, your list of accomplishments is long, and if I start to read them, this podcast is going to start to sound like a monologue. Could you help me with a few that mean the most to you personally? Yeah, I'd be remiss if I didn't say very fortunate. Got to stay in one destination, got to be part of the design of what we had to sell, and then the creation of the sales strategy. If I think about a few things, first would be I was involved, actually I took the first phone call when the Houston Oilers were looking to relocate. Happenstance, lucky. I was the only person in Nashville that knew about it for probably three months. Wow, that must have been hard to keep secret. Oh, so hard. (laughs) But to see what that did to the city, pretty mind-blowing. Next would have been, we had a nickname in Music City USA, but we didn't have a brand. And I believe this organization truly helped the brand come to life. And we truly have a music brand. Then I would say we kind of led the planning, selling, funding, everything for our, it's not so new anymore, but our new convention center at the time. That has been a monster home run. And then we were really involved in landing British Air's flight between Nashville and London. And more than anything, that was just a lot of fun. Something out of our wheelhouse, new to me. Isn't that how the magic happens when it's fun, when people are really enjoying themselves and their work? And that's when things really light up, right? Oh, completely. I prefer chasing something that everybody says will never happen. All in on defying the odds and doing the hard work. Business is great, but we're still looking for more difficult opportunities. So yeah, it is where the magic is. And it's where the feeling, I don't say self-accomplishment. You don't need the credit, don't need the press. You can look across the street or down the road and go, we were involved in that. And it, it's pretty special. Butch is just being modest. Congratulations on your induction into the Hall of Leaders in Washington, D.C., very close to where I am here, actually. I might just have to pop over there and see the display. Do you know what it looks like? I haven't seen the display yet. Truly honored. Didn't see it coming. Didn't nominate myself. Really never thought a recognition like that would occur. You know, we're we're a mid-sized city trying to compete and fight with the big boys. And uh, when something like that comes along, it's humbling as much as anything else. As you know, I'm a huge fan of the films you produce for Nashville, and I want to thank you so much for allowing us to show them on Go USA TV. Let's go back to before your first film, For the Love of Music. How did you convince your stakeholders that it was time for you to make a movie. Well, first, we were working on our website, and the agency that was working with us, I walked into a meeting. There was a guy I didn't know, gruff looking, and he looked at me and he goes, you should do a documentary. And I remember thinking, ass. (laughs) In my head, I'm going, you're right. I'm mad that it wasn't our idea. And then I immediately went to how much it's going to cost. We don't have the money. How many favors we were going to use up. And I didn't think I could ask permission. So uh, I was angry with him. We're good friends today. We literally didn't ask our stakeholders. We knew that nobody would say, yeah, take, I think it was around 300000 at the time, but our budget wasn't very big. Yeah, take 300000 go do a documentary. That's not a travel film. I couldn't sell it. But we, as an organization, have earned kind of the trust factor or the risk factor. You know, they may roll their eyes, my board, the industry, they may shake their head, but they don't doubt us. They'll go, okay, there's another Lucy and Ethel idea. Don't criticize it too much because it might work. And it was an enormous success for us. We were able to tell our brand story worldwide. And it was fun. It was inspiring. It was challenging. I mean, all of the things. But I didn't tell anybody until after it was done. (laughs) 
Gutsy. Very gutsy. There's something unique to us is that we're willing to put our reputation and our track record on the line if we believe in something and try to convince 20, 30, 50 people, you know, to get them all. That's almost impossible. So I'll gamble that I can keep my job more often than not. Actually, I have some good news for you that I haven't even had a chance to share with your partner, Dina. Your second film, the latest one, It All Begins With a Song, is one of the top performing shows right now on Go USA TV in the United Kingdom. This past month, you were just way above everyone else. Tell me about Nashville's success with the UK and how you keep the interest vibrant. I think once we were able to get in and change the narrative, and you know, we're pretty self-aware. So in the 90s, Nashville perception over there was racist, hillbilly, nobody will travel for music, you don't have any real demand. So we looked at that, we took it to heart, but we didn't let it drive our decisions. At first, we were partnering with Atlanta and New Orleans, a joint marketing effort that's been invaluable, still going on today. And then we just started attacking them. We got to tell our story. We got to bring journalists here. And once they discover, I'll say, the real, authentic Nashville, I'm biased, but we're a great representative of what the international perception of the U.S. was. So we're not going to get the first trip, you know, Orlando, L.A., New York. But when you start to make your second or third trip and you want to discover what makes America unique, I think we're a good fit. And that's the angle that we have stuck with and it's it's paid off. I think there's a huge lesson in there for most destinations, right? I mean, it's not just you guys. That's the story for a lot of places in the United States, probably the vast majority of them. You know, it starts with self-awareness. And, you know, if you think you're all that, you're probably not all that. And then committing the time and the dollars and overcoming the obstacle. I mean, it's a, it's a marathon. It is not, you know, a three-year, look how good we did in three years. You better see some results in three years, but it's a closer to a 10-year journey to really feel the payoff. It looks like you had a blast producing It All Begins With The Song. How long did it take you and what were the challenges in making the movie? Um, ended up taking almost a year and a half, making sure we covered the diversity of both the people and the history was pretty important. And the producer, as they were kind of working with it, they thought they were almost done. And Dina, Dina Ivy and I watched it, watched it separately and then together. And we both had the same thought. And that was, I'm going to get fired if I show this film. It was not right. It didn't have the right heart and soul. It didn't have the right storyline in the middle. So we literally made them tear it up or the middle. They were editing in Asheville. So I made three trips to Asheville. I sat in the edit bay for hours and hours on end and looking at B-roll and trying to edit the storyline. So it was tough to get it to congeal. But when we hit it, I would agree with you, I am biased, but we hit it out of the park. But I was scared to death midway through. I think the lesson in that for a lot of destinations is, first of all, hands-on is important and also tenacity is very important in this. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was dealing with people that do this for a living, but they didn't know the story like we knew it. So we had to be there. And to their credit, they listened. They made the edits. I'd say it was a great collaboration at the end that everybody's equally proud of. As you know, many destinations struggle with understanding the difference between creating advertising and creating actual consumer content that generates interest in travel. So I'm hoping you can take a shot at expressing why content creation is so important and how it's different than advertising. For us, number one, it started because we were poor. You know, we couldn't compete with the cities we had to compete with. So we started looking at what are the ways that we can get our message out without having to spend millions and millions on advertising. So big events where we could put our music stamp on those events, like NFL Draft, we'd be one of those. We own New Year's Eve and we own July 4th. So we call them activations in the world of marketing, but we put our activations in the form of of room generation, PR generation, and demonstrating the brand. No money, try to be unique. How do you stand out from the crowd? Because the clutter is deep and wide and there are some great destinations out there doing some great work. The second step would be finding the ways to push that message out that were non-traditional. In the documentary, not only were we out of our wheelhouse in terms of the content, we were going to spend a lot of money and we didn't have an outlet for it. We took the risk. While it sounds crazy, 
it motivates you to get it right because the fallout could be up to and including I'm unemployed. You tend to work a little harder when you gamble a little bigger. But you recently said this to the Nashville Business Journal, and I'm quoting you here. If we lose our unique, authentic music character, creative culture, we're done. We don't have any of the normal demand generators, gaming, theme parks, beaches, mountains. We're living off of our brand and the character of our community. That's pretty vulnerable. You don't have control over it. Could you elaborate on that? I can. 2003, 2004, went through a year and a half strategic planning process with 140 community leaders. And we were at that point kind of dead in the water. This was a do or die, sink or swim for our entire industry. And the brand, big events, and a new convention center were the major outcomes. When we started to look at our demand and we had lost a theme park, we were tanking. And the research that we did, the only thing we have to hang our hat on is this music brand and music city name. It wasn't really a brand then, but that was the goal. We thought if we elevated the awareness of the music brand, the diversity of it, the fact that so much of the music was consumed for free, that we could carve a niche and stand out. So we went down a path that nobody would have bet on. Most of my friends at that point said this would be a great time to leave Nashville, that nobody's going to travel for music. All the advice I got was go now before you can't go. I love a fight. I love the challenge. We took it on, and now there are a lot of cities trying to jump on the music bandwagon. We made it work because we had to. I've heard that the culinary scene there in Nashville has exploded. Tell me about it. Been really fortunate. It really galvanized with two things. When we built our new convention center, we brought in disposable income. And then some friends in the music business started a food and wine festival. And the idea there was, let's bring some chefs from around the country, show them why they should invest in Nashville. So all of that has steamrolled into this unbelievable set of offerings from James Beard chefs to Michelin chefs to unique offerings locally. And the media has paid attention. Food and wine named Locust, one of our newer local restaurants, best restaurant in the country this year. The New York Times named a couple, Locust and Audrey, which is a James Beard Chef's restaurant. So that's given us the opportunity to really talk about a higher-end customer. We've opened up Four Seasons, a One Hotel, a Conrad Hilton. We have a Ritz-Carlton under construction. We're shifting our marketing message a little bit and trying to uh, obtain a higher-end customer that wants to stay a little longer and spend a little bit more. One last question, but it's a big one. I'd like to hear about the Tennessee Titans stadium deal that you've been working on. And before you explain, isn't it a bit unusual for a destination leader to be so involved in such a project? (laughs) Yeah, I think we all play a role somewhere. But when the conversation here went from renovate to new to possible roof, the word roof and enclosed took us from, yeah, we think it's great to we have to engage. So we are making a presentation this month to our city council of the payoff for it. And some of it is our track record from Titans originally, our arena, our convention center. We've not just been on the sidelines supporting. We have blood on our hands. We took the fight to the public because we believed in it, because we knew our industry relied on it. And I truly believe cities are growing or dying. They don't sit still. So every 10 years or so, cities need to invest in themselves. And the product that we have built and demonstrated by NHL stadium game, NFL draft, uh, New Year's Eve is now a five-hour CBS special. This stuff has worked well for us. And so why not leverage all the work and sweat equity that's gone into it? Because the demand is there now. Now we just need an ability to capture demand. Butch, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you today. You're going to have to come back. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you. You made it really easy. And for anybody listening, I hope I answered your questions. Thank you. Quick word to our listeners. If you work at a destination that believes in storytelling, we encourage you to join us in our work in promoting our country on Go USA TV. We're constantly seeking new travel TV shows. So if you've created a show that you think belongs on Go USA TV, please get in touch with us. I'm Mark Lapidus. Thanks for listening. 
Your feedback is welcome. Email us at podcast at thebrandusa.com or call 202-793-6256. Brand USA Talks Travel is produced by Asher Mirovich, who also composes music and sound. Engineering by Brian Watkins. Please share this podcast with your friends in the travel industry. You may also enjoy many of our archived episodes, which you can find on your favorite podcast platform. Safe travels.